Hi guys. So, for the first actual video of Geek Month, I decided to do Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> so, I have my little Ravenclaw bow <laughs> because if you couldn't have guessed already, I am a total Ravenclaw. Um, not only because of my affinity for knowledge and poetry and prose, but I remember reading on Pottermore, because Pottermore itself did also sort me into Ravenclaw, but it said on there that Ravenclaw is known as an accepting house, very accepting of other students and their weirdness, and this is, for example, why Luna Lovegood was placed there, even though she wasn't what one would consider to be book smart, because Ravenclaw smarts aren't about book smarts. So it's not just about reading books and knowing facts, because even Hermione could no read books and know facts, but she did not have that wisdom that Ravenclaws had, and she was not fully accepting, at least not at first, of um, those who were different, such as, you know, such as Luna and her strangeness. Now, I picked, decided to turn to Reddit to uh, pick out a passage from Harry Potter because there are a number of passages that I could think of that are really, really, just, just completely heart-wrenching in the books. But I wanted something that could be relatable even if you hadn't fully read the books. And so, um, this was, the, the passage, this particular passage was, I, I guess, got the most upvotes <laughs> um, on our Harry Potter, was the subreddit that I went to. Um, and it's not only a very important and deeply moving passage, but it was a scene that wasn't in the book, in the movies at all. So if you've seen the movies, but you haven't read the books, this will give you a completely, a very different perspective on um, a character who I felt was, who could have been given a lot more. This one is from Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, that's number five. As you can see, this copy is quite worn. <laughs> Order of the Phoenix was the first of the series that I stood uh, in line at midnight to get. And we were so far at the back of the line that we just ended up going and getting the book the next morning <laughs> after picking up our... after reserving it that night. So. But then I believe he picked it up before my flight to India because that was, we were leaving for India the next morning. And so this was the only book that I brought with me. And I read it so many times. I finished it by the time we had arrived and I started reading it again. And then <laughs> I read it while I was there and my brother read it, and my cousins read it, and... <laughs> but anyway, this, um... <clears throat> you can't tell, I'm a little bit sick, so I'm sorry, I'm trying to drink tea to help with that. This passage is from chapter 23, it's the end of chapter 23, titled Christmas on the Closed Ward, and if you read the books, you probably know which passage I'm talking about, but this one starts with Harry, Hermione, and Ron are at St. Mungo's Hospital for... what is it? St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries. And they are there visiting Ron's father, who has been badly injured, 
and they are sort of wandering around and they come across a uh, confunded, or confunded, the Professor Lockhart from the second book, from when he had his memory all but wiped. Um, they're in the long-term ward, so patients who are going to be there for quite a long time, and presumably Lockhart has been there since the second book, and some of these witches and wizards have been there even longer than that. So, let's see. Harry's head spun around. The curtains had been drawn back from the two beds at the end of the ward, and two visitors were walking back down the aisle between the beds. A formidable-looking old witch, wearing a long green dress, a moth-eaten fox fur, and a pointed hat decorated with what was unmistakably a stuffed vulture, and, trailing behind her, looking thoroughly depressed, Neville. With a sudden rush of understanding, Harry realized who the people in the end beds must be. He cast around wildly for some means of distracting the others so that Neville could leave the ward unnoticed and unquestioned, but Ron had looked up at the sound of the name Longbottom, too, and before Harry could stop him, he had called, Neville! Neville jumped and cowered as though a bullet had narrowly missed him. It's us, Neville, Ron said brightly, getting to his feet. Have you seen? Lockhart's here. Who have you been visiting? Friends of yours, Neville, dear, said Neville's grandmother, graciously bearing down upon them all. Neville looked as though he would rather be anywhere in the world but here. A dull purple flush was creeping up his plump face, and he was not making eye contact with any of them. Ah, yes, said his grandmother, looking closely at Harry and sticking out a shriveled, claw-like hand for him to shake. Yes, yes, I know who you are, of course. Neville speaks most highly of you. Er, thanks, said Harry, shaking hands. Neville did not look at him, but surveyed his own feet, the color deepening in his face all the while. And you two are clearly Weasleys, said Mrs. Longbottom, continued, proffering her hand regally to Ron and Ginny in turn. Yes, I know your parents, not well, of course, but fine, fine people. And you must be Hermione Granger. Hermione looked rather startled that Mrs. Longbottom knew her name, but shook hands all the same. Yes, Neville's told me about you. Helped him out of quite a few sticky spots, haven't you? He's a good boy, she said, casting a sternly appraising look down her rather bony nose at Neville. But he hasn't got his father's talent, I'm afraid to say. And she jerked her head in the direction of the two beds at the end of the ward, so that the stuffed vulture on her hat trembled alarmingly. What? said Ron, looked up, looking amazed. Harry wanted to stamp on Ron's foot, but that sort of thing was much harder to bring off unnoticed when you were wearing jeans rather than robes. Is that your dad down at the end, Neville? What's this? said Mrs. Longbottom sharply. Haven't you told your friends about your parents, Neville? Neville took a deep breath, looked up at the ceiling, and shook his head. Harry could not remember ever feeling sorrier for anyone, but he could not think of any way of helping Neville out of the situation. Well, it's nothing to be ashamed of, said Mrs. Longbottom, angrily. You should be proud, Neville, proud. They didn't give their health and their sanity so their only son would be ashamed of them, you know. I'm not ashamed, said Neville very faintly, still looking anywhere but at Harry and the others. Ron was now standing on tiptoe to look over at the inhabitants of the two beds. Well, you've got a funny way of showing it, said Mrs. Longbottom. My son and his wife, she said, turning haughtily to Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Ginny, were tortured into insanity by you know whose followers. Hermione and Ginny both clapped their hands over their mouths. Ron stopped craning his neck to catch a glimpse of Neville's parents and looked mortified. They were Aurora's, you know, and very well respected within the wizarding community. Miss Longbottom went on, highly gifted the pair of them. I... Yes, Alice, dear, what is it? Neville's mother had come edging down the ward in her nightdress. She no longer had the plump, happy-looking face Harry had seen in Moody's old photograph of the original Order of the Phoenix. Her face was thin and worn now. Her eyes seemed over-large, and her hair, which had turned white, was wispy and dead-looking. She did not seem to want to speak, or perhaps she was not able to, but she made timid motions towards Neville, holding something in her outstretched hand. Again? 
said Mrs. Longbottom, sounding slightly weary. Very well, Alice dear, very well. Neville, take it, whatever it is. But Neville had already stretched out his hand, into which his mother dropped an empty Drubal's blowing gum wrapper. Very nice, dear, said Neville's grandmother in a falsely cheery voice, patting his mother on the shoulder. But Neville said quietly, Thanks, Mum. His mother tottered away, back up the ward, humming to herself. Neville looked around at the others, his expression defiant, as though daring them to laugh, but Harry did not think he'd ever found anything less funny in his life. Well, we'd better get back, sighed Mrs. Longbottom, drawing on long green gloves. Very nice to have met you all. Neville, put that wrapper in the bin. She must have given you enough of them to paper your bedroom by now. But as they left, Harry was sure he saw Neville slip the wrapper into his pocket. The door closed behind them. I never knew, said Hermione, who looked tearful. Nor did I, said Ron rather hoarsely. Nor me, whispered Ginny. They all looked at Harry. I did, he said glumly. Dumbledore told me, but I promised I wouldn't mention it. That's what Bellatrix Lestrange got sent to Azkaban for, using the Cruciatus curse on Neville's parents until they lost their minds. Bellatrix Lestrange did that? whispered Hermione, horrified. That woman Creatures got a photo of in his den? There was a long silence, broken by Long Lockhart's angry voice. Look, I didn't learn joined up writing for nothing, you know. That's the end of that chapter. <laughs> um, sort of sudden flip to funny from the very sad, which J.K. Rowling did a fair bit of. This entire sort of mini, I don't know if I'd call it a mini plot line, but this bit, this uh, growth of deepening of Neville's character was cut out of the movies and I really I really liked it in the books and one of the things that was brought up was that Neville was thought to be the other option for who was supposed to be become uh, the chosen one I guess because there were two options because um, Neville also lost his parents to, uh, the Dark Lord in this way, by, you know, them losing their minds, just as Harry had his killed. Um, Harry and Neville were also born on the same day, and I can't remember what else was mentioned in the prophecy, but there are other things that they have mentioned that also fall in line with both Harry and Neville, but because... Voldemort tried to kill Harry. He marked Harry as his equal. He marked like, like it was Harry. He could have sought out Neville and killed him, but he didn't. And I believe like it was a similar situation where like before uh, Bellatrix found uh, Neville's parents, they had been forced into hiding, and I don't know the details behind that story as much as I used to, because I did used to be very deeply obsessed with Harry Potter. I used to have a big stack of books just analyzing the series, and the backgrounds between the characters, and the dynamics, and the, the world, and all that sort of stuff, but I don't know that as well as I used to. But I always found it fascinating, and I always, I always kind of liked the idea that maybe, maybe Neville was the chosen one. And even though I knew that wasn't going to happen in this series, I always thought, well, what if, you know? Like, what if um, Neville had been the chosen one? How would he have, you know, risen to the occasion? How would Harry's life have been different, you know? Because a lot of the... Um, a lot of the support that Harry got in his life, he got because he was famous. So what if he hadn't been? What if it had been Neville 
who was this famous character, especially given that Harry didn't grow up in the magical world. Neville did. So how would Neville growing up have been different if he grew up knowing that he was going to be the one to kill Lord Voldemort? So, it's interesting to think about. I think in many ways Neville is presented as a, um, not a foil, but like an alternate view of what Harry's life could have been like, you know? For example, if he had grown up um, in the magical world versus not, um, or, you know, what if Neville had grown up with his muggle family, how would that have been? Um, or what, how things would be different if um, Harry's parents had not died, but had been, you know, been made insane, like Neville's parents were. And, I guess, which is worse, you know? Seeing them there, but not fully there, or having them just completely gone? Because, while this scene is incredibly, deeply sad, you can still see that love that Alice, Neville's mother, has for him, even though she can't express it, even though the only way that she can show her love for her son is by giving him a, a wrapper for bubblegum, you know? And just the fact that he keeps it, like, he understands that. So, there you go. For anyone who says that Harry Potter is just a fantasy story, is just a children's book, and is not meaningful, throw this at him, because, well not the, the book physically, well, don't say I told you to, but <laughs> there are a lot of bits in this series that prove that it's more than just a fantasy story. It teaches you a lot. Like, I mean, any kid who grew up reading under the covers like I did understands that books, the books you read shape you as a person. And I think I learned a lot about people and a lot about relationships and a lot about family and life and friendships from these books. So, I always hate to see people undermine them, I guess. Anyway, um, I think, I think that's all my voice can handle for today. But, um, I will see you guys next time. Hopefully, not as sick. <laughs>